Hi, this morning I'm talking with Howard Rheingold, who is an influential thinker and writer on social media and, uh, and consciousness and creativity. And he is the author of Tools for Thought, The History and Future of Mind-Expanding Technology, The Virtual Community, Homesteading on the Electronic Frontier, and Smart Mobs, The Next Social Revolution. And uh, the book we're going to be talking about, NetSmart, How to Thrive Online, is his latest. Welcome, Howard. Thank you, Anne. Great to, uh, great to be talking with you. You know, I've been following your work for some time um, back from your days on the well, and it's been really interesting to follow the evolution of your thinking and uh, advocacy for, you know, what, what strikes me in general as um, a call for uh, critical thinking. Yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of that came from examining the the reaction to my own writing and a lot of it came from thinking about what so what are we going to do about uh, the situation how can we improve the the quality of the online commons and I, and I think the the answer has to be in, in improving the the cluefulness of the people who are contributing to it and that includes thinking critically about the information that they get because after all uh, I think you, you might say the price we pay for the the magic of being able to get an answer to any question within seconds is that there is no authority that guarantees the validity of that answer you've got it you've got to figure it out for yourself so Although, of course, critical thinking has always been important and I think to some degree neglected in education, now that instead of getting a book out of the library that we're, we're pretty sure is accurate, we get information from search engines that, that have no guarantees. It's absolutely essential to, to be able to think critically about information. And you also you also uh, tackle the topic of literacy, which I find to be uh, particularly important. You know, I, I work a lot with adults trying to figure out various social media things, and I'm always trying to reassure them that it's not that the technology is beyond their grasp, it's not that the concepts of the tool is beyond their grasp, it's a lot of it has to do with being able to read the screen, it's a type of literacy that seems to be the most important thing, as you point out in your book. Well, you know, basic reading and writing is not beyond anybody's grasp, but it's not easy. To, you've got to learn the alphabet. We've all forgotten that it took years to learn to read and, and write. And that's the, the, the price and the power of alphabetic literacy, is that if you, you go through those years of training, then you have access to this tremendous store of knowledge and this great tool for transmitting knowledge across time and and space and now we've got these technologies have come along so quickly the microchip the personal computer the the digital network the the web everything that's been built on the web that that the uh, the means of learning how to use them effectively have have lagged behind as is always the case you know it was 50 years between the introduction of Gutenberg's printing press and the and the Protestant <coughs> Reformation which was really driven by by print literacy it took 50 years for literacy to spread in Europe and and we we haven't even had 50 years for this technology that's so much more complex than alphabetic literacy and you know the the good news I think is that it's a lot less expensive to, to learn and to teach how to use these media than it was to, to wire up the world and to, and to put, what is it, five billion uh, mobile phones in, into, into people's pockets. Right. Let's talk about the five literacies that you, that you spend the, the book uh, discussing. The first one is attention, which I, uh, <laughs> as, a, as a former classroom teacher, you know, that's always, the first one is the most fundamental one. And sometimes uh, the mo I, I like your examples of how you engage your classrooms in thinking about attention from day one. Well, you know, any any college professor in the world knows now with Wi-Fi in the classrooms that they're competing with the entire internet. We're we're looking not always at the faces of our students, but we're looking at their their 
lids of their laptops and, and they're looking at their laptops. So I'm asking my students to be, be, begin to become mindful of where they are deploying their attention. Screens are such attention magnets and it's very useful in the classroom to pop open your, your laptop and, and look up what the teacher just said for the first time in history. Students can check in real time to see whether the teacher knows what, what he or she is talking about uh, and to, uh, to make notes. But it's also very easy then to check your email or to slide into Facebook without really thinking about it. So I'm, I'm asking my students to, to do a number of attention probes in the classroom so that they can begin to become more mindful of where they are deploying their attention. Mm -hmm. And the, the next literacy that you talk about is crap detection, which seems to um, so relevant. I'm, I can't even tell you how many emails. I'm sure you get the same thing. You know, the same memes going over and over through the internet. People honestly thinking that these are actual stories that have hit the news when it's just it's satire or it's just spam or something. So, well, there are urban legends. Uh, there are cloaked sites that that aren't what they seem to be. There are uh, AstroTurf sites that are paid to not be what they seem to be. There are hoaxes and, and jokes uh, and just plain inaccurate uh, information, misinformation, disinformation, uh, along with all of the, the good information. And when you're talking about politics or medicine, your, your life and your liberty may be at stake. And, and who doesn't uh, Google their symptoms? Um, who, uh, when, when they are diagnosed with a serious disease, does not go online. There's a lot of great support and information out there for people with diseases or who are caregivers for people with diseases. And there's a lot of information that could kill you if you if you if you don't check it out and take it seriously. And then there's a lot of scurrilous rumors about political figures uh, from from all parts of the political spectrum that that people pass along as you as you you noted in in the email you know there's no way we can we can regulate the information that people put onto the onto the web in fact if that had happened we wouldn't have the web what we can do is increase people's awareness of the bad information out there and give them a few tools to begin figuring out where to find the good information you know one very easy thing to do is to look for an author for any information you get and then search on the name of that author and there are well-known websites to check those those email um, chain letters that you get snopes.com is one of them to see whether they're, they, they are known hoaxes so it's not really rocket science it's not even learning the multiplication tables but most people are not told that they really ought to, to search on the name of an author and that, that, that they ought to to double check what they find online Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I find so useful in your book is that you sort of lay this all out you know, and you, you know, point by point going through how people can actually, as you say, Snopes and, and Googling the author's name and so forth and verify what they're finding. Yeah, and, and NetSmart really contains a lot of information specifically about how to do what I'm talking about. When I say that we need better attention literacy and crap detection literacy and point out why I also uh, try to give people tools to, to do it and I, I've got something like 500 footnotes in the book just so that if you don't if you're skeptical of a claim that I make then go ahead and do what I'm telling you to do go ahead and cl click on the link and, and, and check it out for yourself check out the sources absolutely and in fact let's uh, let's bring up the uh, the um, the cover so people can see. Is that there it is, yeah. Through? There it is, yes. NetSmart, yeah. Great, so um, let's see. Uh, now I need to get back to me. <laughs> okay, so uh, participation. Now there's so many different ways to participate. Uh, there's there's your basic social networking tools and, and particularly, you know, I, I uh, talk to authors a lot and just in the, the, the publishing space, there's so many ways and, and authors and readership, there's so many ways to participate now. But you have some really great guidelines for people to not only participate but also to collaborate online. 
Well, yes, I have separate chapters for participation and collaboration, and I, I think, you know, the, the, the literacies build on each other. You really need to have some kind of grasp of attention literacy to, to think critically, to do the, the crap detection part. And you really need to do those two things before you participate. And, and I think participation is just naturally um, shades into collaboration. So much participation puts you in touch with communities. So you can start out very easily. Uh, you can just read websites. You can maybe plus something on Google Plus, or you can like something on on Facebook. You can you can tag things. You can you can maybe move up the the the, the ladder of engagement a little bit by commenting. It's so easy to start a blog. You can you can edit Wikipedia. There are there's, there's Tumblr, there's Twitter, there's so many different ways that that people can participate. It's really easy to to get started, and I think once you get started participating, that introduces you to all of the different ways people collaborate. You know, we've got virtual communities, we've got collective intelligence efforts like Wikipedia and and many others. We have crowdsourcing where people are 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 breaking up big tasks into lots of little chunks and many people are, are participating in, in them. There's citizen science is a good example. People are, are classifying galaxies and, and going through craters on, on Mars and, and, and helping NASA scientists uh, classify them. There's what's called social production that, uh, that creates open source software and, and Wikipedia. You know, I could go on and just naming the different genres of collaboration. We have the ability to do things with other people that we were never able to, to, to do things with before for, for all of our benefit. But it only benefits those who, who really know how to use it. And again, I think the, the good news is that it doesn't really cost you anything. What it costs you is, is learning, learning how. And, you know, participation takes takes time, takes a little bit of learning, but it comes back to you. Um, whatever your field, you will find others and you will and people will send you information and you will find emotional support. Many of the things that people get in their face-to-face -face communities you can find online, but it's not going to just come to you. You, you need to actively participate. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the most important points I think you, you touch on in the participation uh, section is to assume goodwill. You know, if you think that somebody's attacking you or if you think that somebody's being a little snide, just assume that it's a misunderstanding and go from there. And I, I like that. I, I, it seems to go with your, your overall uh, point of view, which is that you choose to be hopeful. <laughs> Well, it's hopeful and it's nice, but uh, but this uh, this uh, uh, tactic has actually been proven to 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 work. Um, so you you mentioned being back on the well. You know, when you don't have uh, facial expressions and tone of voice to to really understand what people are intending, it's easy because written language is ambiguous to, to, to think that they are attacking you or, or making a sarcastic or a snide remark. And, and I have found that it is most often the case if you simply say, um, can you explain what you intended with that, that people will point out that they, you know, what, what they meant to say. Um, actually wasn't an insult at all. So most of the time, the perceived insults that start flame wars online are actually misunderstandings. And, you know, sometimes people are nasty, absolutely, no doubt about it. But I think anybody who tries this will find that 90% of the time, if they think somebody is attacking them, and you simply politely ask for clarification, you'll find that, that, that you misunderstood or they miscommunicated. So, but I am hopeful, you know, uh, optimism, uh, it's hard to be really optimistic. There are a lot of things to not be optimistic about. But as you said, uh, hope, hope, being hopeful is a choice. And, and I think that uh, we are the descendants of uh, people who decided that it looks hopeless, but there must be some way out of this hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Well, I, I think that you've provided a great roadmap for people who want to. Uh, in fact, I, I showed your book to a friend of mine who teaches uh, in New York, and he's going to use it as a text for one of his, you know, entry-level communication studies type of uh, classes out there. So, I, you know, I just think you've laid it out in a really useful way. And reading it, you know, I, I mentioned in an email to you that I'd been, I, I found your book on my shelf with Stephen LeBurge from uh, way back in Lucid Dreaming, and this does not seem that that large of a leap from being aware that we're dreaming to being aware that we're in a network and there's all these different nodes of information and we need to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. That's right. Uh, both lucid dreaming and the kind of attention that you need when you're online are, are what's called meta cognition, which is simply being aware of where you are deploying your attention. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's a, a type of lucid waking experience. Absolutely, same thing, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Howard Rheingold, thank you so much for talking with me this morning. You're very welcome. Good luck, Anne. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.